It's unfortunate, but errors happen in medicine from time to time. Oftentimes they are minor and have little to no effect on patient care. However, in some instances, patients do get hurt as a result. Typically, when medical errors occur, the usual worst case scenario is that the healthcare provider involved gets their license revoked. However, a new precedent may have just been set that impacts everyone from paramedics to nurses to doctors and everyone in between. Last week, former RN Redonda Vaught was found guilty of gross neglect of an impaired adult and negligent homicide. She's facing three to six years in prison for the neglect charge and one to two years for negligent homicide as a defendant with no prior criminal history. This case is atypical as homicide charges against healthcare professionals are usually reserved for cases of intentional harm or practicing without a license. This case falls under the third and most controversial category of extreme medical negligence or criminal negligence. The classic example of extreme negligence would be something like an intoxicated surgeon who operates on a patient who later dies from a complication. The incident occurred at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in late December 2017. According to sources, Ms. Vaught was serving in a help all nursing role and assisting another nurse in the care of a patient being treated for a subdural hematoma. At the time of the error, the patient's condition was reportedly improving and she was being prepared for a PET scan. Prior to the imaging study, the patient reported reported that she was claustrophobic and would have difficulty tolerating the PET scan, so the physician ordered Verset, a sedative, to be given to help calm her nerves. When retrieving the medication, the RN reportedly could not find it in the automated medication cabinet, so she used an override function and mistakenly took out Vecuronium, a powerful paralytic, instead. According to allegations, Vought ignored several warning signs before ultimately delivering the incorrect medication. She also failed to monitor the patient afterwards and left the patient with radiology staff unmonitored. The patient was found by transport approximately 30 minutes later, unresponsive and in cardiopulmonary arrest. At this time, CPR was initiated and a code was called. While running the code, the patient's primary RN identified the mistake and informed Ms. Vaught, who then reported it to the physician in charge, as well as the leadership team. The healthcare team was able to achieve return of spontaneous circulation, or ROSC. However, the patient had already suffered an anoxic brain injury that she was unlikely to recover from. After discussion with the family, it was decided that the patient would be categorized as DNR, do not resuscitate, and receive comfort care only. She died shortly after being removed from mechanical ventilation. Later that day, two Vanderbilt neurologists reported the patient's death to the Davidson County Medical Examiner without mentioning the medication error or vecuronium. The patient's death was attributed to bleeding in her brain, and based on the information provided, the medical examiner did not independently investigate the death. Ms. Vaughn reportedly had multiple conversations with risk management over the next few days and was ultimately terminated the following week. The fatal medication error was not reported to state or federal officials by Vanderbilt leadership as required by law. Now fast forward to early 2018, Vanderbilt reportedly negotiated an out-of-court settlement with the patient's family that requires them not to speak publicly about the death or medication error. The exact settlement is not publicly known, but has been confirmed by Vanderbilt in interviews. In October 2018, an anonymous tip was provided to the federal health officials regarding the unreported medication error. The Tennessee Department of Health, which is responsible for licensing and investigating medical professionals, was made aware and decided not to pursue disciplinary action against Ms. Vaught. In response to the tip, the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services conducted an investigation at Vanderbilt to look into the matter further and confirmed that the patient died from an accidental dose of vecuronium, which went unreported to the government or medical examiner by Vanderbilt. In response to their investigation, the CMS found that the hospital failed to mitigate risks associated with medication errors and ensure all patients received care in a safe setting. As such, the hospital placed all patients in serious and immediate threat and in immediate jeopardy and risk of serious injuries and or death. Due to their findings, the CMS threatened to suspend Vanderbilt's Medicare payments unless they were able to prove that they had taken steps to prevent a similar error. Vanderbilt responded soon after with a plan of corrections outlining the changes that they were gonna make to prevent future incidents from occurring. This appeased the federal agency and Vanderbilt was allowed to continue receiving Medicare payments. In February 2019, Ms. Vaught was arrested on a criminal indictment for her role in the patient's death. The trial was delayed due to COVID, but ultimately ended on March 25th, 2022, finding Vaught guilty of negligent homicide and abuse of an impaired adult. All right, so obviously a very controversial case, a very big deal in medicine. So let's cover the arguments supporting the decision, the arguments against the decision, and then some of my final considerations. So first up, arguments supporting this decision. Those who support the decision argue that the nurse was incredibly negligent and she ignored multiple systemic checks that would have prevented this from occurring. They argue that this is an extreme 
extreme case of negligence and that any reasonable nurse would not have made the same error. So let's cover some of those mistakes that she made. So first, she couldn't find the medication because she was searching for Versed, which is the brand name, rather than Midazolam. So she used the system override and took out the wrong medication without double checking. Second, even if she took out the wrong medication, she needs to read the vial. And then at that point, she would realize it's the wrong med. And ultimately the nurse is the final check. Third, she didn't follow the six rights of medication administration. And those are, right patient, right drug, right time, right route, right dose, and right documentation. Fourth, Vecuronium is a powder that needs to be reconstituted, whereas Versed is a liquid. She should have realized when reading the reconstitution instructions that she had the wrong med. Fifth, there are multiple warning signs on the vial stating that it is a paralytic, as well as a warning right above the reconstitution instructions, and she would need to read those reconstitution instructions prior to administering the medication. And number six, she didn't monitor the patient after administering the medication. Even if it was Versed, that is a higher risk medication and would warrant some monitoring. The other argument for this is that it sets an example, so other health her workers might be more careful and, and may not make as many mistakes if they know they're going to be held personally liable. All right, now let's talk about arguments opposing this decision. So first up, homicide charges against healthcare professionals are usually reserved for intentional harm or practicing without a license. This case falls under the third and most controversial category of extreme medical negligence, which is sometimes also called criminal negligence. This then raises the question of where do you draw the line of what is regular negligence versus criminal or extreme negligence. Those who are opposed to the decision raise both the honesty and the intent part of the equation. So first of all, she was honest. She owned up to her mistake. She did not try to hide it. She informed the appropriate parties, namely the physician and the NP, as soon as she realized the mistake. She also notified the charge nurse, clinical staffing leader, the educator's office, as well as the neuro nurse manager and risk management. So despite Vought having many different conversations with various leaders of, of leadership, it was ultimately Vanderbilt that failed to report it to the proper authorities as required by law. So overall, she followed the reporting procedures that she was supposed to, and she was transparent with her mistake. Another point is that the patient's family actually opposed criminal indictment of Redonda. Her son said that he knew his mother would have forgiven Redonda for the mistake she made and would be upset if she had to spend time in prison. She had already suffered enough, he said. The next counterpoint is losing her license. So because she's already lost her license, she won't be able to make the same mistake again. And one could argue that there's really not much to gain by imprisoning her because you're not changing patient safety or the surrounding systems. It was her mistake that ultimately uncovered some of those deficiencies at Vanderbilt, which have since been hopefully resolved. The next point is that she wasn't the only one at fault. So there were definite systemic issues at Vanderbilt. I mean, for that reason, CMS was threatening to withdraw funding. So this raises a few questions. As an example, why are nurses allowed to independently override the medication cabinet and take out a paralytic like Vecuronium? Or number two, why is Vecuronium in the radiology area? Number three, some hospitals actually have a two nurse system for either certain meds or for overriding the medication cabinet. So why doesn't Vanderbilt have this? And then number four, why did they not have a scanning system down in radiology with bracelets to confirm the meds? According to the hospital's high alert medication policy, which both Versed and Vecuronium would fall under, there was no documentation in this policy detailing any procedure or guidance regarding the manner and frequency of monitoring patients during or after medication administration. Then you also have the staff at the PET scan who had the patient in a monitoring room and they actually have cameras, but those cameras weren't high resolution enough to see whether or not the patient was breathing. So then they found her 30 minutes later unresponsive. It also appears that the physician failed to document the medical error and relay this information to the medical examiner for a proper investigation. And then of course, Vanderbilt leadership did not report the incident to the appropriate authorities. So essentially there were many other parties that had varying levels of involvement and yet none of them are receiving any punishment. Another counterpoint is that this may lead to under-reporting errors. When you have a president like this, nurses and other healthcare professionals are gonna be disincentivized from reporting errors because they don't wanna encrypt themselves. Many hospitals actually allow healthcare workers to come forward and report these errors without any fear of repercussion. And that's important, right? Because you can't improve your systems if you don't actually know how the system is breaking and, and where the errors are occurring. So a lot of hospitals actually have MNM, Morbidity and Mortality Conference, and I saw this a lot in surgery, both in residency and you know, even as a medical student, you will attend m and conference when you're rotating on surgery and some other services. But if the staff is afraid of criminal punishment, then they're probably not gonna report things and then you can't as adequately improve your systems. And the final point is that by setting this dangerous precedent, we're actually going to discourage people from entering healthcare. There's already a shortage of nurses and healthcare workers and incidents like these are just a 
like a blow to morale. Okay, so I wanna finish up with some of my own thoughts. So first up, the system is set up in a way that actually makes errors more likely to happen, both for nurses and other healthcare professionals. There's understaffing, and then you have a higher ratio of patients to healthcare workers. Those healthcare workers are now overworked and they have a higher risk of making some errors. I can't speak to the nursing profession in terms of the hour restrictions and when they need to take breaks, I think they're definitely better than, than doctors, but I can speak to doctors, right? Because in residency, I mean, there's days when you're working 18, 19 plus hours and then you still need to come in the next day. And we have enough data and research that points to the fact that sleep deprivation is very bad and increases the rate of errors. And they, they even compare driving sleep deprived to driving drunk as an example. So overall, errors are much more likely to occur when you have a system that stresses out the healthcare worker in such a way and increases the risk of errors. Errors like this can happen to anyone when they're put in such extreme circumstances. And it's concerning when you have such a precedent that's now set. Why is it that truck drivers are only allowed to drive for up to 11 hours per day because of concerns of safety and sleep deprivation, but we don't have the same rules for healthcare workers. So the key thing to focus on here is the idea of systems, right? I talk a lot about the benefits of systems, usually as it relates to productivity, but you also use them elsewhere in life, like obviously in a hospital and also in my business. The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande is actually a really good book and it goes over the checklists and systems and the processes in place, both for pilots and for surgeons and how it's so important in reducing errors. When errors happen, it points to a deficiency in the system and it gives you an opportunity to focus on the deficiency and then improve the system as a result. So in my business, we use a lot of systems. We use checklists and schedules and standard operating procedures, et cetera, to make sure we're doing what we are meant to be doing. We can't just say, hey, we're gonna provide the best service because we try really hard and then hope we provide good service all the time. It doesn't work that way. We need to have a system that allows us to consistently and reliably produce the results that we wanna produce. And if an error occurs, then we go back to the drawing board, see why that error occurred and then fix the system. And the same thing applies here to this case. Yes, the nurse made a series of mistakes but the system wasn't robust enough to catch them, clearly. And you can back that up because the CMS was threatening to defund Vanderbilt because of the issues with their systems. Which is kind of strange, right? Because on one hand, we're acknowledging that the systems at Vanderbilt were subpar, were insufficient, and yet the full blame is being placed on the nurse. So this is a big deal. You almost never hear about an individual getting convicted in this manner. This raises those questions, right? When is someone acting too negligent? Or if someone dies from a medical error, should a single individual bear the full responsibility? And is it appropriate to put someone in jail as a result? But I wanna know, what do you guys think about this? Let me know with a comment down below, but please keep it civil, you filthy animals. I'm just kidding. Much love my friends, and I'll see you guys in that next one.